the real grimdark is the truths you learned about yourself along the way. So I guess I was taking this rather personally, but I don't even have the book. I'm gonna talk about Wisdom of Crowds. Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about The Wisdom of Crowds by Joe Abercrombie. Um, so this is a terrible time to be filming this. <laughs> But I finished it last night, or technically this morning, at like 1am. So I just, just like the trouble with these, I just have to talk about it immediately. However, I got like no sleep. My neighbors are, have currently decided to start playing really loud music, so I really hope you can't hear that. Uh, my cat scratched my face today, so I covered that up with makeup. Uh, and I'm leaving town tomorrow, so like I really need to be packing right now. But instead, I'm gonna talk about Wisdom of Crowds. Oh, and also my cat is meowing at me right now because um, I locked her in the bedroom so that she wouldn't fuck with all of this. Um, so I hope you can't hear the music or the cat or the traffic or any of the other things. We're just gonna power on through, okay? So uh, I'm gonna do a non-spoiler review uh, for the most part and then I do wanna talk about spoilers and unlike Trouble with Peace, when I do two separate reviews, I'm just gonna do spoilers at the end of this. So I'll give you lots of warning uh, when I'm gonna talk about spoilers, um, so. Anyway, yeah, great, okay, let's do this. So The Wisdom of Crowds is the third and final book in the Age of Madness trilogy, uh, and also the final book for now <laughs> in the world of the first law. And uh, I, if you've been watching my channel at all um, in the last, you know, honestly in the last week probably, but this year I've been rereading all <laughs> of the first law books and I've said it so many times in all my videos been like and I'm reading this because I'm reading all of the first law books in anticipation of the release of the third and final book of the Age of Madness trilogy The Wisdom of Crowds and here we are The Wisdom of Crowds I don't even have the book because uh, most of my pre-orders are coming from the UK um, so it's gonna be a minute before they arrive and I didn't put Wisdom of Crowds on my TBR in September because I was like no I'll, I'll read it in October because uh, I'm reading Trouble with Peace in September and I did read Trouble with Peace I did do that <laughs> And then I woke up on Tuesday and my phone, uh, the first thing it told me was that my audible pre-order of Wisdom of Crowds was ready to go. And I was like, great, listen. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, no, zero self-control. And uh, I, was, I was a little anxious after spending so long anticipating this book and putting kind of a, a great amount of pressure on it. Like, would it live up? Because a little hatred dethroned my former favorite book and then Trouble with Peace dethroned a little hatred. And I was like, well, Wisdom of Crowds, are you gonna dethrone? And yes, yes it did. I cried. <laughs> I have never cried reading an Abercrombie book at all. Not even teared up, not even a little bit. And I was ugly crying last night. Um, and we'll get into why in the spoiler section if you stick around for that. Was it good? It was good. And it just, it cannot be the last first law book. It just absolutely cannot. Both because I need more, but also because um, there's so many seeds planted for what could come in future stories and future books. Few, new things for uh, him to explore, uh, new areas of the map for him to explore. And uh, I really hope he does. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, even if it had wrapped up neatly in a bow, I would have been like, great, well, just pick another part of the map and just start telling a story over there. I don't care. Uh, but it's, there's definitely seeds planted. I, I, I'm, he's gonna write more. Okay, but so it's, okay, it's really hard to do no spoilers for the third book in a trilogy and the final book in, like, an ongoing saga. But okay, we're gonna do our best. <laughs> a Little Hatred and The Trouble with Peace set up a world that was uh, going through an industrial revolution, and with that also comes... Uh, populism. <laughs> so the first two books were sort of following a, a painfully familiar trajectory, both for anyone that studied history and anyone that's living nowadays in our current world. It's, <laughs> this trilogy has just been an extremely relevant and home-hitting one, uh, even more so than first law books have been in the past. And first law books, in my opinion, have always been kind of uh, painfully realistic. <laughs> and it's been one of the most, honestly, cathartic things about reading first law books. Is, uh, is seeing how cynical and corrupt and how futile and how uh, just, you know, bad people doing bad things, but not for, you know, mustache twirling reasons, but because, because of little things, because of little evils, because of greeds and ambitions, because of petty rivalries and jealousies, and how despite the best efforts of good people, and there's massive asterisks to anybody that is a good person because and you read an Abercrombie book and you begin to lose faith in the idea of such a thing existing. Not because everyone in his books is evil, just because 
what even is a good person? Like, even if you present a good facade to the outside world, if this is somebody that other people would say, oh, he's a good guy. I mean, we, when you crack open the hood and you look beneath at what's ticking, it isn't necessarily <laughs> uh, benevolence and selflessness and all these greater morals and virtues. A lot of times there is there are selfish reasons, there are ambitions, there is greed, there are other things beneath the surface that color what you've been seeing on the exterior as something incredibly virtuous. Few things are what they seem. So good guys aren't necessarily that good and bad guys aren't necessarily that bad and everyone's just a big dark gray mess. Anyway, we've brought an already relevant writing style and world into an industrial and populist age in this trilogy, which has just been chef's kiss because I haven't seen a lot of fantasy series do that. It is so painfully relevant for the times. And then the master character builder that is Joe Abercrombie has somehow gotten better. <laughs> He's improved upon perfection. So that's a neat trick. And, and he got me to cry. He got me to cry. That's the one thing he hadn't achieved yet, is <laughs> getting me to cry. And okay, we've done it now. So what else can I say without spoilers? Is it a satisfying conclusion? I would say so. Uh, the seeds that are planted uh, throughout this trilogy and throughout the series in general, there's just a lot of, as I've mentioned before, characters from previous books who pop in and out, uh, who do... They aren't the main characters anymore in this new trilogy, which is great. But unlike the new Star Wars movies, <laughs> where they take the characters from the, the beloved characters from the original trilogy and shove them in and then do them such a disservice and completely assassinate their characters. Uh, no, the this new trilogy, uh, when it does incorporate familiar characters, it does it sparingly. It does it only when the plot really needs it to. And it's never destroying what you once knew about this character or once thought about this character. I mean, it helps that... None of the characters were like great heroes like Luke or you'd be like, he was such a hero and you ruined him. I mean, this is the first law, so I guess it would be the only kind of character assassination is if they turned into Dudley do right all of a sudden then you'd be like, what? Anyway, everybody, everybody who's a new character, everyone who's an old character, everyone who's a character in the first law in this new trilogy has just been incredible to observe, to follow, to, to get to know, to try to unpack, to try to guess at what they're about, because obviously you're in their heads, but you only know so much. You only know what Lord Grimdark has chosen to share with you. So you're, you're still guessing at their motivations and what they might do next. And they, they do surprise you sometimes. And that's what I love about it as well, is that sometimes you can predict what they're going to do. And that's not a bad thing, because if it's well written, that means you've come to know this world and you've come to know these characters and an intelligent person can begin to make educated guesses. And it's not poorly written if the reader is able to guess what's coming. A lesson that the showrunners of Game of Thrones <laughs> never learned. If you plant seeds for something to happen and people start noticing that, that's that means you've planted the correct seeds. <laughs> so there are there are things um, in this like final book um, that I did. I can't say I predicted anything like precisely, which I think is unreasonable, but there are things that I was starting to get a, a sense that might be kind of where this is going or might be what a character might do, might be what a character is trying to accomplish or where their head's at. And for a few things, I was correct. And But it wasn't like, oh, well, I saw that coming. I, it was very satisfying, nevertheless, because I didn't know exactly how that would come about. And the way that it came about felt earned. The payoff was there. It felt true to what we had been told, what we had come to know. Um, and, and even again, so even though I guessed some piece of it or kind of the overarching thing that would happen or the direction something would go. I never guessed exactly how that would go down, exactly who might be involved, exactly what would be said and how that would be accomplished. And and I might guess that somebody is attempting to accomplish something, but I can't guess if they're going to be successful at that. So it was just a very rewarding third book because, again, questions that you had were being answered. And sometimes it was something that you were like, oh, yeah, I called it and oh boy, <laughs> or it came out of nowhere. Uh, but not, again, not in a bad way. Uh, th there were still surprises. There were things you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so it was just, it was great. It was, it was perfect. It was amazing. And it was even more, I don't know, not, not maybe more relevant, but I guess each book in this trilogy has sort of driven the knife in deeper with how relevant it feels and how, how painful that dark mirror is when it's held up for us to see our own selves and our own society and our own worst tendencies uh, play out in grimdark glory. You're like, oh, yeah. oh, this feels a little too familiar. Oof. All I can say is if this whole year of me rereading the books and heaping praise on them and then 
like anticipating this book so much and despite the amount of pressure that I put on it to be great it still lived up to my expectations and did not disappoint me because uh, I could not po have possibly hyped it more to myself than I did. A little like the day after Christmas when you're five years old. I mean, it's over now. <laughs> I've been waiting for this all year and it's over now. I have no first law book to mark as want to read on Goodreads. I have no first law book to be refreshing every fancy bookseller's website waiting for the special edition signed edition to be available for pre-order. There's just nothing. <laughs> My life is meaningless now. I always feel like Inigo Montoya in Princess Bride. And he spent so long plotting his revenge that he doesn't really know what to do with the rest of his life. <laughs> I spent so long anticipating the wisdom of crowds, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I honestly don't think I can say anything else without spoilers because we're just so far down the road now that, um, yeah. I can't, I can't say anything that wouldn't be spoilery for some piece of this, so. Uh, if you haven't read Wisdom of Crowds, if you haven't read The Age of Badness, if you haven't read anything in the first law, what are you doing? <laughs> but so uh, with, I think without further ado, I do need to dive into spoilers before I burst. So if you have not read them, just click away now and go pick up whichever book you left off at uh, and just get caught up. Okay, spoilers. So I mean, the reason that I was ugly crying last night, I think if you've read The Wisdom of Crowds, which I sure hope you have if you're still sticking around for this part of the video, uh, is because of Orso. And as I was explaining this to like the few people that messaged me about how, oh, did he write something super sad or whatever? And he did write something super sad. Like the fact of Orso dying, I, that's, that's sad. But I don't know that that would make me cry necessarily. Like the fact of that, um, it was the way that scene was written. And even now, every time I think about that scene, it's the way that it's written that absolutely kills me. I mentioned my trouble or uh, trouble with peace reviews that Orso is the character that I most identified with personally, saw myself in him. So I guess I was taking this rather personally, but I, I mean, I don't disagree with the choice. I mean, I kept thinking to myself as the plot was going down the road that it was going, I was like, there's just, there's just no way like that he survives. <laughs> and I wasn't so much thinking about life and death as just like, he has no place in this scheme. He is not useful to anyone. He isn't gonna be a player. There's there's no there's no play here. So at best he runs away and lives in obscurity. But yeah, as as these different plots and plans and schemes were coming to fruition and, and meeting their natural end, I was just there's no place on this board anymore for Orso. And I was like, so where are we gonna find a place for him? Are we gonna find a place for him? We're not gonna find a place for him. <laughs> like I couldn't say that I was surprised that that he that he died. And I couldn't say that I was unprepared for it because I was sitting there going, Is is he gonna die? And there were several times that I thought that we would that he might die. And so when we finally came down to it, it's not like I was unprepared. It's not like I didn't think the story was gonna naturally go there. And it's not like I haven't seen first law characters die characters that I really like. Um, but the way that that scene is written, where he's still being, it, despite everything, he's he's putting a, I don't want to see a brave face, because it's not a brave face, but he's putting a cheery face on it. Uh, it, it was, it's kind of, uh, in key, it reminds me, it reminds me of Oscar Wilde. Um, I don't know if this is actually true, but I've heard this many times, and I like to think that it's true, that his last words were, either this wallpaper goes or I do. But that was kind of like the vibe of Orso uh, facing the gallows, just sort of making a last few cracks and jokes while he still could. Jokes at his own expense, jokes at the expense of his own imminent demise. And just that, <laughs> the way that that was written, like if he had, if he had gone to the gallows nobly with, you know, a stiff upper lip, what, what, it would have been, it would have been hard to read that, but <laughs> it was, it was the, you know, you're either laughing or you're crying, kind of, which, again, this is why I see myself in Orso. Like, I do not want to say that, oh, I too would face the gallows with a smirk and a twinkle in my eye. And I would be, I mean, I, I would probably be screaming and running away. But I have been known to say you're either laughing or you're crying a lot <laughs> in my life. And that was his entire vibe in that scene. And then because, I mean, well... When he dies, his POV has to end, but because it was being told from his perspective, then we didn't really have eyes on him actually dying. And so innocent, sweet little me was like, 
Maybe he's faking us out again. Maybe it's a trick again. Maybe, 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 maybe. <laughs> We're gonna go through these other POVs and suddenly find out that he's actually alive and that there was a last minute trick. There was a last minute pull of the punch. Uh, but, but no, it was like a second dagger to the heart when Savine was like, you hung my brother or you hanged my brother. And I was like, oh no, he's really dead. But even then, I didn't really cry. I didn't cry and I didn't full on cry until the book was over because I just kept holding out hope that some way, somehow, he's not dead. Even though I knew he definitely was. But until I'd read the last page, there was still hope. And then, then I finished the book and then I just thought about him smiling <laughs> as he faced the gallows and I was like, oh no. So yeah, I was I was a mess. Um, so yeah, that's that. Those are the big feelings. But so other spoilers, less Im I don't want to say less impactful spoilers. But that's the thing that made me cry. But so the so the other stuff. I already said in trouble with peace that you know you could and I'm sure I'm not the only one that observed how Leo was sort of going down the path of Glockta, and I thought that by the end of Wisdom of Crowds, I would really like Leo if he sort of fully transformed into the crippled butterfly that is Santa and Glockta. And uh, yeah, he, he turned out to be a real dick. He, at first, you know, it was fun to see him get smarter and him get more uh, wily and ambitious. And, and by the end, you know, you really, when Savine is like, yeah, no, I, you are what I made you. You're kind of my creature. I taught you to be this way and I remember wishing you'd be more this way, but why well, I don't wish that anymore. I kind of miss when you were dumb and pretty because the scheming version of you, it's just, it's not same as Galacta because there's your hot headedness and your, your self aggrandizing tendencies are still there somehow against all odds. He's so, so stubborn and a lot of his worst kind of the sexist ideas and and this weird kind of power hungriness that doesn't even come from I guess it's ambition but it's not I, I don't even know what to call it I, I mean it is authentic to the way certain people are because ever probably writes characters amazingly well so he's definitely feels like a fully fleshed out authentic character and you understand what's going on there it's just I don't oh you really don't like it you're you're not fun you're kind of awful you're so awful I wish someone would kill you versus every basically everybody else in the series good or evil I would say I I liked you I mean and, and liking them is is always a a word with multiple asterisks in an Abercrombie book but they were people that I guess I enjoyed that even when they were being awful I was just like oh that's awful but with Leo by the end I was like I really fucking hate you dude can you please go jump off a cliff <laughs> do us all a favor <laughs> versus I mean Savine certainly makes mistakes um she kind of has to eat a lot of crow but the way that she has to sort of face adversity in new ways and kind of face up to what her preconceptions were about how the world works, about how who she is in the world, about what she is capable of, about what her values are. I mean, she doesn't turn into Mother Teresa, but she does kind of have to realign her values, which is it feels very authentic to what she's gone through when she learns that, okay, and this is, I, when we had the prophecy from Ricca, I pretty much called um, that the owl would be Ricca as soon as we had the situation with her long eye. I was like, well, the, the owl would be Ricca. I was like, maybe possibly the owl is Baez because Baez has eyes on everything. Maybe. But I think it's Ricca. Um, so I was correct. <laughs> at least as far as, or at least Ricca agrees with me. She thinks that the owl is her. But so I also then thought to myself that the weaver, even though we were told it was Pike, part of me thought that either... Baez is behind this, um, even though it seems to be going against Baez because they're going against Valentin Balk. Um, you know, maybe he's seen, Baez has finally seen that Valentin Balk has outlived its usefulness and it's time to burn it down and start fresh, which is possible. I was like, or it's Glockta. <laughs> and I was, I've definitely favored it being Glockta. I preferred that outcome. And I didn't think it at all uh, improbable that it could be Glockta, especially how close he was with Pike and how much he hates Baez. And how he just kind of so quickly just sort of melted away into the shadows and was like, here, Pike can be in charge now, toodaloo. It's like, okay, if you're either behind this or you are up to something. So uh, he was behind this. And what I didn't see coming, a lot of people I'd seen predicted that Zuri was an eater. And I didn't think it unlikely that Zuri was an eater. What I didn't suspect was that Glockta knew she was an eater and purposely put her 
with his daughter uh, to be protection against uh, you were sulfur. Like, I was like, wow, that is some 4D chess, my god. <laughs> but a lot of these things, again, like, it was satisfying to see them pay off because there's enough seeds planted to where, like, I have some idea about where this could go. And so, like, if we came out of nowhere and we said that all along it was clover that was behind everything, you'd be like, uh... Well, I didn't see that coming because that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> From the broken, no. Speaking of Clover, Clover is like my new favorite character. I loved him from A Little Hatred and I've continued to love him more and more. So I am delighted that the end of this book kind of puts Clover in the spotlight where he could easily be the focal point of a new of a new trilogy, a new series, or even a standalone. I'm very excited to see more of Clover. Clover! Uh, if I was crying over Orso, I was laughing over Clover a great deal. <laughs> he had some of the greatest one-liners, some of the best witticisms, and he was just such a such an amusing energy to have around. Uh, greatly appreciated Clover. And something kind of told me that he's like, he's got that cockroach energy where he's he's gonna survive. He's gonna make it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can kill that guy. Probably should, but he's sort of uh, sort of like Casca in that way, where he's very amusing. Uh, is in a lot of dangerous situations, but never puts himself in danger, at least as little as possible. Clover is fantastic, and I never ever get tired of seeing Shivers, just Shivers, but also I never get tired of seeing Shivers with Rika and a certain fail. That little family unit, if we can call it a family unit, and I'm gonna call it a family unit, it's so precious. <laughs> I mean, they're horrible and violent and bloodthirsty and etc. but it's just so, so sweet. <laughs> Uncle Shivers and Tricky Rika and good old Cerna Fail. <laughs> if there was anybody that I wanted to like hang out with, like for real, because I mean, usually when there's like questions, you know, on booktube or on the internet that are like, if you could live in your favorite fantasy world, which would it be? And I'm like, my favorite fantasy worlds are like grim dark worlds. So no, I don't want to be in the world of the first law. I basically already am, except with smartphones. And if I have to face this world, I'd rather do it with a smartphone. Thank you very much. So I've never really wanted to be able to transport myself into the world of the first law because uh, I'm not that much of a masochist, but <laughs> I wouldn't mind hanging out for a day with Shivers, Isern, and Rika because <laughs> they're they're fun. <laughs> I was delighted, delighted, delighted to see Stour get killed because it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Jeez, that guy. I was w almost worried that he wouldn't. I was worried that, that Rika would decide to be the better person and I was like, fucking kill him. <laughs> And she did. And it was glorious. <laughs> what else? What else? What else? I was, um, I guess a little disappointed in Gunnar Broad just because, I don't know, the way he got swept up in this populist uprising. It's not unbelievable that he would given his past, but given also everything that he had, that, that Savine had done for him and for his family, I, I kept waiting for him to be in on some kind of plan to save Savine. And it was very disappointing to me that he was just full on, he had drunk the Kool-Aid and was down to kill Savine. And I was like, really, dude? Really? But, uh, it's, I mean, it is realistic. So it's, it's not like I can say that that is out of character for him. I was just, I was like, man, sir, I'm very disappointed in you. And then, I mean, Glockta and Baez, the, uh, as Savine puts it, the fact that Glockta wanted to defeat Baez and in doing so became Baez and... I mean, she's not wrong, but at the same time, I couldn't help feeling like, you don't get it, Savine! This wasn't necessary! Because, <laughs> I mean, was it necessary? I don't know. Is Are things better now? I don't know. And the fact that, you know, basically Glockta's plan would include getting rid of Orso as well. My heart was a little too bruised to be okay with that. I was like, Glockta, you are my favorite character and you are really, really testing me right now with this plan that involves offing Orso. <laughs> I mean, oh, and, and also, I'm jumping around all over the place if that has not become clear. <laughs> Only Abercrombie could write um, a book in which I am shipping the incest couple, even after we, I mean, we knew they were incestuous all along, even before they knew. If we, I mean, if you had read the books in publication order, which is what I recommend, and I'm very disappointed in anyone that ignores publication order. But, I mean, from the get-go, you know they're brother and sister even when they don't know it. And so, I mean, part of you was like, well, they don't know it, so I guess it's fine. Well, incest isn't great, like, they don't know. So, I mean, if they never know, I mean, it's fine. So I was almost mad when Artie told 
Savine, I wanted to be like, well, so what if they're brother and sister? These are royals. Like, they do that shit all the time. Just whatever. Let her, let her marry him. You've lied this long. What's the worst that can happen? Their kids will be a little funny. Like, whatever. <laughs> so then even after they learned about it, and even when they were still kind of like, I, ugh, that's my brother. Ugh, that's my sister. But also like, Ugh, I'm still into them. I wanted to be like, okay, we'll go be together then. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> he had me questioning my morals in the first Law trilogy when I was on the side of the torturer. And now I'm questioning my morals because I'm on the side of pro-incest. <laughs> the real grimdark is the truths you learned about yourself along the way. <sighs> But I don't, I mean, I just, okay. And so the end where we get this incredible vision from Rika and we have these seeds planted where Clover is with Bias and is going to be training the next generation. And I mean, you know that things are not going to go well in the Agriant with Sabine and Leo who are ripe for civil war like on day one. So this does, I mean, I guess this just doesn't feel, it is a satisfying conclusion of this trilogy. However, it doesn't feel like a conclusion to the first law because there's so many seeds planted for what could come next. And I kept thinking that too when I was reading it. I was like, this is really all going to wrap up by the end? And I mean, it does. Like the main things that are going on in this trilogy are wrapped up, but there's just so much, so much more to come. I hope there's another trilogy, but I'll take standalones. I'll take whatever. <laughs> but there's gotta be more because you can't just dangle all that stuff. It was it was practically like a Marvel post credit scene. <laughs> there was like, here's an elaborate vision and here's Baez plotting again already. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, so when is the next installment coming our way? I think I'm done. <laughs> I think I've run out of things to gush or complain or wax poetic about. So let me know in the comments down below what you thought of Wisdom of Crowds because if you are in this part of the video then you have read Wisdom of Crowds and if you are in this part of the video and you have not read Wisdom of Crowds, shame on you. Whatever you want to let me know. <laughs> I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well but nothing Saturdays so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined and I'll see you when I see you. Bye. So I just finished the Wisdom of Crowds <laughs> and um, I'm gonna film I think my reviews tomorrow. I was originally not gonna do, uh, I'm not gonna film reviews immediately after um, because I'm, yeah, um, but I think I'm gonna. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just wanted to capture I mean, I'm gonna film a spoiler review, so I just wanted to capture my immediate reaction after reading it. Um, I have never cried <laughs> reading an Abercrombie book, and <laughs> we didn't go from no crying to like a gentle glistening tear. I am like full on ugly crying. <laughs> oh my god. While I was reading it, I wasn't crying. I mean, I teared up a little, um, but I didn't cry because I kept, <laughs> I kept believing that there was just some way that it wasn't what it seemed. That there was gonna be a, a it's a, it's, it's gonna be a switcheroo. He's faking us out. Um, but no, he really did that. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, if you watched my spoiler review, or my non-spoiler review, I forget where I said it. In one of my two reviews for The Trouble with Peace, I mentioned that the character that I most identified with in the new series and probably in all of the first law is, um, Orso. <laughs> so, um, yep, this is rough. <laughs> Um, it was so good though. Um, so yeah. Um, five out of five stars. Um, I, probably my favorite Abercrombie book now, except also like, how much of a fucking masochist do you have to be to make your favorite one the one that makes you ugly cry? <laughs> um, but I was not expecting to ugly cry reading an Abercrombie book. I've read and reread 
all of his books. The original trilogy, the standalones, sharp ends, and now the new trilogy. Never cried. Did not expect going into Wisdom of Crowds that I would cry. Like, I would joke that I'm gonna cry because there's no more first law books, but... And I mean, that is upsetting, especially the way this ended. Um, he has to be writing more first law books the way it ends. Um, but... Oh my god. <laughs> it's been...